Okay, all right, so um, the way I like to proceed on evidentiary-based motions is I hear brief argument, um, uh, like an opening, and then you go into your evidence, and uh, prior to you going into your evidence, I hear a brief opening from the state, uh, and then we'll treat it just like a mini-trial. All right, so, all right, Ms. Millard, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, on behalf of Tim Ferreter, I'm requesting that the court grant a downward departure in this matter. Um, as the court knows, Tim Ferreter scores about 75 months in prison pursuant to the score sheet. I have detailed in my motion, I won't belabor it, several grounds that I believe this court can utilize for a downward departure in this case, um, both under the enumerated subsections and under what I am calling uh, perhaps too freely a catch-all. And there is, in fact, case law that I've provided to the court showing that should the court um, find evidence to support a downward departure that is not specifically enumerated in the statute, the court can um, do, do, the, the court has the ability to, to do that. Um, as far as the presentation that I'm going to make today, I think that something that is incredibly important, um, and I'll name these people uh, at the end, is the amount of support that Tim Ferreter has here today. It is the vast majority of what we see on Zoom, and it is the vast majority of the audience today. His wife is here, his mother Maureen is here, and she will speak to the court. He has friends here and people that have supported him throughout his life and continue to support him today. The court was also presented with, I think, a total of 34 character reference, um, you know, people that have known him his whole life. I think that what happens during the course of a trial is that we're so, and, and this is for the right reasons, we're so focused on the facts and how they apply to the law that we don't always see the whole person. And that is my hope today. Another thing that I hope to present to the court through my first witness, Ms. Carrie Williams, is a real uh, depiction of what it's like to have a child with reactive attachment disorder. Ms. Williams is a parent of a child with reactive attachment disorder and an advocate herself for a number of parents. And with that, I'd like to call her as my first witness. Okay, before doing that, um, does the state wish to make any brief opening as to what you intend to demonstrate with respect to the motion alone at this point? To the motion alone, Right, to the motion alone. basis for downward departure here. The defense advances one statutory basis um, and then basically the catch-all saying that there should be a non-statutory basis. But the way that that works is that the court has to find that there is a valid legal ground and the fact that the defense of the of the arguments that the defendant has advanced are not valid legal grounds for downward departure under the law. It's clear that restitution is, is not an issue here. None of the other grounds that they raise are sufficient. And the, you know, the defense said, well, we should look at character. We should look at the totality. We should rely on the testimony of people like their first witness who have no firsthand knowledge about anything in this case or people that are anonymous. Um, and so the, a, a person doesn't get sentenced in the court of law based on what people watched on YouTube about a criminal case. And so yeah. for the defense or for the court to rely upon that as a legal basis of, ground, of, of departure would depart from the essential requirements of the law. And even if there was a valid um, ground for legal de uh, for downward departure, the court then should look, based on the totality of the circumstances, whether or not it would be appropriate, considering the aggravating and the mitigating factors in case here. And I think based on the hours of the defendant's conduct that the court had the opportunity to observe firsthand, it's perfectly clear that this is an intention, intentional, malicious, cruel, and callous act against a vulnerable child. And as such, it's not appropriate for a downward departure. Okay, all right, thank you. You may call your first witness, Ms. Moran. Thank you, Your Honor. At this time, the defense calls Carrie Williams. Damn, she just hammered that. Box. Oh crap, he said the box. Uh, there was no pun intended, I'm sure. Thank you. Hi, 
I'm Ms. Williams. Could you introduce yourself to the court? I'm Carrie Williams, and I'm a uh, parent of a child with reactive attachment disorder and also an advocate for other parents of children with reactive attachment disorder. Have you testified before in court? I have not. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a few questions, and then the state's going to have the opportunity to do so as well, okay? Mm -hmm. I first want to start with what your advocacy work is. Can you explain that to us? I do speak at some conferences and do some writing in various platforms, but what I mostly do is I provide community and resources for parents of kids with their active attachment disorder because that is the gap in our system that parents don't have. So I try to help parents feel seen and heard, point them in the right direction for resources, and also just allow some empathy for parents because that might not fix the problem, but it definitely can help them um, cope. Have you published about being a parent of a child with reactive attachment disorder? I've published a number of <clears throat> articles um, in different uh, publications, as well as two books. Um, I wrote a book that was called The Essential Guide for Rad for Parents. Um, and the reason I wrote that book was because I found that this information was not in a consolidated place for parents. There was no, at the time, no single resource where they could go and they could find out, what am I dealing with? How can I get help? What, what would help me at this point? And so um, that is why I published that book, to give parents that kind of one-stop place to get the information that they needed based on basically what I wish I had known when I had my child. Um, with reactive attachment disorder and did not have. Um, and then after that, I uh, published a memoir, um, and I wrote it to read like fiction because I realized that part of the reason people don't understand reactive attachment disorder is that they literally don't understand what's happening in our homes. They have no sense for that unless they live it themselves. And so what I wanted to do was write something that reads like a novel so that people could kind of walk in my shoes and begin to understand it and understand how the dysfunctions of the mental health system and the child welfare system are affecting families and affecting children and preventing us from getting the help that we do need. Where, um, you said that you've published a number of articles. Where have you published? Like what? Um, on um, um, BuzzFeed, um, I've been on NPR. Um, adoptive families, uh, fostering the family, um, several different platforms. I've also had op-eds about this in the Sun Sentinel and the Charlotte Observer. Um, and I know you talked about your memoir, um, and this is about your child with reactive attachment disorder, and you did, in fact, write this with your child's permission, correct? Yes, I did. Um, so how many people throughout your advocacy work or families that you work with, have you helped, if, if you have a number on that? I've personally interacted with hundreds, um, but there are tens of thousands that have read my books. Um, I've given away 5,000 of my books. Um, so there's a huge, this is a huge issue in the adoptive community. It's a hidden issue uh, that people don't talk about much. Um, but in addition to that, I've had, um, I have a website where I've had a quarter of a million hits on it, reading my articles about this. So um, it's hard for me to judge how many people, because a lot of people I don't personally interact with. But I've interacted personally with hundreds of people at conferences um, and online, things like that. And the people you're interacting with, are they usually parents of children with reactive attachment disorder? They are. Um, they may be adoptive parents. They may be foster parents, uh, step parents. So there's some different scenarios where it can happen. But yes, it's parents who have children with reactive attachment disorder. You said that you wrote these books and started your advocacy work because this is a really hidden issue. First, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by the fact that it's hidden? Turner, I'm going to object and say improper opinion and relevance. Uh, I'm overruled. I'll give her some latitude in this area. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's hidden because um, when parents adopt and they go through classes or they take whatever training, um, this is really underplayed as a possibility because, of course, they want you to adopt children. Um, so instead of giving you the proper training and the proper information, um, you go into adoption without knowing. And then as a parent, you um, are parenting the child, and you've been told that love can heal this child and help with whatever trauma they've been through. And you very quickly find out that that's not true. And there's a lot of shame and embarrassment in that. Because as a parent, you know you're failing. You're not able to parent this child. No matter what you do, nothing is working. And um, so that can be really devastating for parents. And so parents are not always reporting it. Um, and when they do, they're often not believed or blamed and shamed. And is that something that you experienced yourself? Yeah. Sustained. 
Is that something that the parents that you've worked with have experienced? Objection as to relevance is not applicable to this case. Your Honor. Sustained. Your Honor. She could talk about the, her experience with her own child, but that was the she, first question. She, she's not she's not an expert uh, that's been qualified in the court's view to talk about Rad as a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a medical professional, but she's a mother who has raised a child with Rad, so I, I'm going to allow her to testify as to her personal experiences and what uh, her opinions as a mother are, but um, you don't have to go much further to qualify her as an expert to talk about um, what would be tantamount to psychiatric, psychological, and medical opinions. Judge, I'm not asking her. Just ask your question. Re-ask it. I've, I've ruled on it. So you want me to re-ask it, or? I want you to rephrase your question in a way that's consistent with my ruling and proceed. Based on your personal experience as a mother of a child with reactive attachment disorder and as a person who has worked with hundreds of people. Nope, nope. The fact that she's worked with hundreds of people is not relevant to this case in this court's view. I'm going to allow you to talk about her experience as a mother raising a rad child because that's what's relevant. Uh, that the, the, the court finds marginally relevant for purposes of sentencing. So I will allow you to rephrase the question again, consistent with my ruling. Based on your personal experience, did you find that kind of shame with raising a child with, or sh sharing what it was like to raise a child with reactive attachment disorder? Yes, absolutely, and that's one of the reasons that I do talk about it and write about it, to try to bring awareness. Why did you start your advocacy work? Um, right after the Parkland shooting, um, I was watching the media and I was hearing a lot about um, how the mother saying why didn't the mother get help and also that um, the biggest argument in the media was that people needed more access to mental health care and that was very disturbing to me because my son has been in 18 facilities over eight years and so I know that, that mental health is not there and so the issue is we can give people access all we want but if the mental health treatment for RAD is not in place that's not going to help us. So I wanted to make that argument, and I also wanted to make the argument that sometimes parents do try to get help, because I tried to get help for years. It took me years to get help. Um, and so I wrote an op-ed for the Sun Sentinel on that um, topic, and that is how I got started. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your experiences as a parent with a child with reactive attachment disorder. Now, you have a number of children, both adopted and biological, is that correct? Yes. And one of them was diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder. That's correct. When was that child diagnosed? Um, I'm not sure of the year, but he was 11. Um, so talk to me about, you said that when you adopt a child, when you personally adopted a child, you were not sort of prepared for what that might mean as far as any behavioral issues. Can you explain that to me? Your Honor, I'm going to object to the relevance that this person's personal experience has to do with the relevant to the sentencing of this defendant. Response? Your Honor just stated that she was permitted to speak only as to her personal experience. Um, I another objection made as to relevancy, so just make your record for how you believe this is relevant. Court. Judge, I think it's relevant because first off, in a sentencing, there is leeway and the evidentiary rules are relaxed. I think that one thing that this court was not able to hear during the course of the trial, um, based on whatever the rules of evidence are in a jury trial and what a jury may hear, is what this experience is actually like. So actions, and particularly as it relates to the defense's first ground for downward departure, um, I apologize, I don't have the subsection in, in, in front of me, but it's essentially the language on provocation, is the court has to understand what it's actually like to walk in the shoes of a person who has a child with reactive attachment disorder. Additionally, I think it's imperative that the court understand that this is not some sort of fringe, and if this witness is permitted to testify, you know, the, the actions that the ferreters took, though inappropriate, were not fringe. Uh, she's not going to be able to testify on the propriety of the actions that the ferreters took. I think she can testify as to what's available on the Internet for parents with reactive attachment disorder and hearsay is admissible in a sentencing hearing. She's not an expert, though. She's a mother who raised a rad child. Your Honor. All right. As in well, if, you, if you're asking her to give a psychiatric medical counsel, please don't interrupt me. Oh. If you're asking her to give a psychiatric medical or psychological opinion about what is an appropriate treatment for dealing with a rad child, 
That's an expert opinion. I don't care whether it's in uh, the main trial or it's in a sentence of uh, hearing. You're asking this witness to provide an opinion that requires expertise that's recognized under the law that enables her for, to do that. I, I just, I've indicated that I will allow. Who's that? All right. Um, I've indicated I will allow you to, to have her talk about her personal experience of what she went through, but I'm not going to allow her to opine as to what the Ferritors, or Mr. Ferritor in this instance, should or should not have done. That requires an expert opinion that I don't believe this witness is competent to provide. And I'm certainly not going to allow her to provide medical, psychological, or psychiatric opinions. You can make your argument, respond for the record to preserve your rights on appeal, but we're going to proceed in accordance with my ruling that I've just stated on the record. I understand, Your Honor. I would like to make one point. I am not trying to have this witness, who is a layperson, testify about a psychiatric opinion. I do think that a person can say, when you look on the internet, no one's saying that what they did was appropriate. That wasn't even the defense at trial. This witness will simply say that there is a lot of bad information out there and a lot of lack of good information for parents. This witness has testified that her own child went to 18 different facilities. So what? So what? How does it connect to this particular case, unless you're going to put on evidence that the Ferritors tried time and time again to uh, you know, scour the internet to seek consistence that, counsel, please don't interrupt me when I'm making my point, okay? Unless you're going to put on evidence that they sought out specific help on the internet and they got bad advice, the fact that she says there's bad advice uh, or bad information on the internet, what's it relevant to you? You've got to tie it to my responsibility is to appropriately sentence Mr. Ferrer for the charges that he's been found guilty of by a jury. So. This, this has to be focused on what his conduct was and what the explanation and justification for. I mean, this lady um, may have gone through hell and high water to raise her child with Rad, but there's no guarantee that her experience is even remotely close to the same as what Mr. Fairley experienced because I've heard no evidence that all Rad uh, children react uh, in the same way. So I, you're going down a path that I don't think I can allow you to go down too far because it, this becomes a mini trial uh, on another person's experience um, with a rad child that at the end of the day doesn't give me any relevant information that's really going to assist me in determining what an appropriate sentence is. So that's, that's my concern. I'm going to give you some latitude, but it's got to be reasonably tailored to how does it relate back to the conduct that Mr. Ferrer engaged in. So um, whatever point you want to make for the record, make it and then ask your next question. I will ask my next question, Your Honor. I believe I've already laid my record. Um, as a parent, uh, did you find that your child was misdiagnosed? He was misdiagnosed with ADHD um, early on, yes. Um, and can you describe for the court the difficulties in obtaining treatment? Well, let me start with this. After you went to different counselors or the therapist, were you getting accurate, like good treatment for your child? I think one of the problems is that parents don't have a way to judge that because we're not experts, right? So I think one of the issues is that when parents have a child who has these types of problems, you know something is wrong and you know that it's not normal for like a neurotypical child, especially like if you're like me and have other children um, who you can kind of gauge that with. And so when you do go to get help from a pediatrician or you try to go to a therapist, especially if you don't get one who's adoption competent, a lot of times, in my experience, um, I did get um, some bad information early on, and I think it's one of the issues is it's very hard to know how to even find the right kind of help. Like, I didn't know what to Google to find the right kind of help. I didn't know what the word reactive attachment disorder was. Is that common to not even know what reactive, I mean, when you adopted your child, was someone like, you should look out for reactive attachment disorder. This is something that may come down the pipe at some point. No, they do talk about early childhood trauma, which is what causes reactive attachment disorder. Um, but they really tend to minimize that, at least in the trainings that I've been in. Um, they minimize it and say, you may find this happens with your child. And there are some um, behaviors that are very common with adopted children that they will tell you are going to may happen to you, um, like, you know, food hoarding, potty issues, um, attachment issues. 
And so you kind of go in thinking that's pretty normal for these kids and that if you just love them and take care of them, they will heal from it. And when you find that doesn't work, how are you reacting as a parent? I think for me, um, I was trying different things, um, different methods. I was looking for different solutions. So I was trying, um, you know, traditional parenting, therapeutic parenting. Um, I took Tell me what those words mean, traditional parenting and the therapeutic parenting. Traditional parenting is more um, rewards and consequence based, where um, therapeutic parenting is more where you are focused on the connection with the child instead of the issue that you're dealing with. So um, I tried those things. I did go to a doctor. I got an ADHD diagnosis. I took my son to a, um, a therapist, and I mentioned the um, hoarding of food, and they acted like they had no idea wh what I was talking about because they didn't have a, a background in that. And so I didn't go back because I knew they wouldn't be able to help me. Um, and so I did go to a number of different places. Um, but again, because I didn't know what reactive attachment disorder was, I just kind of was flailing, um, not understanding what was going on. And how does that affect how you react to your child? Well, I'm not sure I could. I'm not sure I can answer that. How it affects how you react to your child that you don't know what's going on. Um, I think that can really depend, and it certainly was a roller coaster for me. Um, but I do think that over time, because the behaviors are persistent and everything you're trying to do doesn't work, I think it can become extremely frustrating and demoralizing. And I do think, I know I um, was diagnosed with um, PTSD afterwards and depression, um, and I think that it's the persistence of it over a number of years that this is happening that makes it very difficult to manage. Um, I know we had talked about an, a sort of analogy that you had made. Are, are there behavior, in your experience, were there behaviors that your child was doing that were seemingly really small, that people just didn't understand as being dangerous or violent or frustrating as a parent? Um, yeah, um, my son did have certain um, behaviors that he would do because he would find that, uh, he would find that he knew that those things bothered me. Um, so it's kind of like, I liken it to kind of like when you have a dripping faucet, it's something that's small, but it can over time, especially over several years, drive you crazy. Um, so it can become very intense for parents because a lot of parents like me don't have a break. So we're, you know, 24 seven pretty much on with this child and we're having this, this, this problem. So it can become very difficult to handle even small things. How is that different from your children who are not diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder? those sort of persistent behaviors. Can I'm, I'm just trying to illustrate mm -hmm. or trying to have you illustrate what the difference is in those behaviors. Mm -hmm. So I have three children when a uh, year's age difference. Um, I had my um, adopted son who has RAD and his, also his sister and then my biological child. So I had kids within a very close range um, to compare to. And so what I would find is I would find that, um, you know, if they were misbehaving and I gave them a timeout, maybe I'd have to do it a couple times. But um, my daughter and my biological son, they would eventually learn, because most kids can learn from just behavioral management like that. But my other son, he would just persist. It didn't matter how consistent I was. And of course, you know, they teach you, be consistent. These kids need consistency, so you keep trying to stick with the same thing. Um, and that doesn't work over time. And so what is the solution? What was the solution for you? Well, the situation got much worse over time, because I couldn't find a solution. Um, and it got to the point where there was a violent episode that happened in my home, and that was kind of a trigger for me to have a wake-up call and realize that I could not manage this safely in my home. And so I started uh, going to the mental health ER, and eventually my son was able to go to residential treatment. That did not solve the rat. It didn't cure it. In fact, his condition got worse. But it did create safety for my other children and for my child who has rad. What were the conditions that you you experienced either with your child at those treatment facilities? <coughs> um, he was in a number of facilities from uh, group homes to RTF to hospitalizations, uh, residential treatment facility. Um, so he was in a variety of these um, different facilities. I was never able to get him into a facility that specialized in RAD. I'm, I'm not sure if there is one in my state. I never was able to find one. So these were kind of general. Um, facilities. 
And they really were just managing his behavior. They did do manic medication management, and they gave him lots of med no, medication. Didn't work. Um, mm. And he did. He, my son was quite violent, and so when he would have violent outbursts, they would restrain him physically, or put him in um, like a padded seclusion room where they would monitor him. Um, and they would also uh, give them PRNs, which are injections of things to sedate them. And I was very surprised by this. I didn't realize that this is kind of what was standard protocol in facilities. But obviously, since my child has been in 18 of them, it is standard protocol. And it is how they handle you know, kids who are in violent, having a violent episode. Did any of those facilities work? There were two um, facilities that my child was in. Um, where I felt that the clinician definitely understood and was trying to help. Um, and they certainly helped me become a better parent and helped me understand. My child was resistant to treatment, so it did not help from that perspective. As someone who has um, sort of personally experienced having a child with reactive attachment disorder, what has your... Um, What are your thoughts about, I guess, what do you want to share with the court as it relates to sentencing in this case? Um, so I feel that parents are very hesitant to try to get help. Um, there, again, as I said, there's a lot of shame and embarrassment around this. They're also normally when they go to people and explain it because it is so... Um, out of the realm of their knowledge, they're not believed by people. Um, so it's very hard to try to get help. And so I do feel that this case in general and um, the sentence will deter parents from trying to get help because they'll be afraid of being vilified and also because they'll feel that um, there's, no, there's no analysis being done of the mental health system, the child welfare system, adoption, kind of the root causes. So a lot of these people, a lot of people are kind of doing the best they can, and we need to give them better solutions, especially if we want to deter them away from the wrong solutions. Is there anything else you'd like to state to the court that I haven't mentioned, Ms. Williams? I don't think so. I don't have any additional questions. All right, thank you, Ms. Maud. Class, by the state. circumstances of this case, correct? No, I do not. Um, you don't have firsthand knowledge of um, the type of behaviors, if any, that occurred in this case by the child, correct? That's correct. Um, and you don't have firsthand knowledge of the um, efforts that the defendant made, if any, um, to get professional help before he took it into his own hands, correct? That's correct. Um, and in your case, you sought out psychiatric help for your son, correct? Yes, I did. Um, and that when it wasn't sufficient, it, you elevated it, correct? Like you went to a psychiatric hospital, and then you went to inpatient treatment and all different types of um, alternatives, correct? After a number of years, yes. Now, um, you said that you have published on this topic, but you're not a mental health counselor, correct? That's correct. Um, you don't have a PhD in psychology or a doctor of psychiatry, correct? That's correct. You're not a licensed clinical social worker. Oh, nope. correct. Um, you haven't had the opportunity to watch the hours and hours of video of the offense in this case, have you? I have watched some of it on TV, but that's all I've watched. Okay, so your experience of this is someone who watched it on court TV. Yes, but I'm here really to share my experience, not an opinion on that. Mm -hmm. um, and when we talk about your experience and the publishing of it, you, you publish it in places like BuzzFeed, correct? Mm -hmm. and, I, and you just have to say yes or no. Yes. yes. Um, and did things like do op-eds, correct? Yes, that's part of what I did. Correct. Um, an op-ed is where you write your opinion, correct? Yes. It's not something that's peer-reviewed or necessarily even fact-checked by... It is fact-checked, but... It's not peer-reviewed. It's not peer-reviewed, yes. Edit. It's your opinion. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I don't have any other questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. I want to respond first to the state sort of talking about your experience. Um, you said that you've spoken at a number of conferences, correct? Yes. So tell me about sort of your role in this field as an advocate. I mean, are people asking you to speak at conferences as a person who's personally experienced this? 
Yes, I, uh, my role as an advocate is based on my personal experience and the fact that I'm willing to tell my story, which again, I said a lot of people are not willing to do um, because of the embarrassment and shame around this type of a topic, but I think it's very important because we need solutions. This is a hidden crisis in the adoptive community, but I am speaking as a parent, yes. Um, and the state mentioned some of the uh, publishings that you had done. I mean, we're talking major newspapers, NPR you've spoken on, is that correct? Yes. Um, and you've also spoken on the news about being sort of your personal experience with reactive attachment disorder, right? Yes. Um, you said you didn't have any firsthand knowledge of this case. How many families have you helped personally? I've had a correspondence with hundreds. Um, and you, and those are all people with adoptive children or children with reactive attachment disorder, correct? There may be some people who think their child might have it and are not yet diagnosed. But and certainly yes. when you speak with those people, you are not personally offering psychiatric or psychological um, opinions. So sort of what are you giving to those families? What is your role as an advocate? Um, I see my role as affirming them in the challenges that they have and then pointing them in the right direction. So I try to make sure that people are getting good advice, um, that they're being sent to reputable organizations for help. Um, so I kind of see my role as um, helping people understand what's going on um, so that they can move forward faster than I moved forward. Because a lot of people just don't have that information. They want, you know, I wanted to do better earlier, but I didn't have the information. And that's what I'm trying, that's the gap I'm trying to fill. You said that you're trying to help people get good advice. Is there bad advice? There is some, some bad advice, bad advice and, some and some good advice. advice. But there's a lot of advice, yes, because parents are giving parents advice uh, in, the in the absence of having, of having uh, treatment, treatment for this. For this. Okay. Um, you also okay. said that you don't have firsthand uh, knowledge of, of course, you were not living in the home with Tim and Tracy Farader, correct? Correct. Um, did you watch this trial? I watched most of it. And um, did that include uh, looking at or reviewing some of the um, behaviors that were discussed of the child? Mm -hmm. Yes. And is that consistent with what you personally experienced? I'm going to object to Dan Popper. I love that question. She's asking me about her personal experience, not her opinion, your expert opinion. So I'm going to allow it. Yes, I've experienced some of those behaviors with my child. Um, I don't have anything. To say. All right. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Is this witness excused? All right, you may step down. Thank you. Ms. Murad, call your next witness. Your Honor, my next witness, I have to see if he's on Zoom, is Father Prescott. And unfortunately, my eyesight is failing me. Is there anybody in the waiting room? Can't think of. Um, what's the last name? Prescott. Yeah, it's in the waiting room. All right, you can bring him. He's got to know he's toast. Is he in the, what, what's, what's his name? Uh, it just has an initial with the last name. He's a priest, that's why I think that's. Where do you see him? Right there. OK, all right. Um, Father Presto, um, can you hear me? Where's that feedback coming? All right, so you need to mute your, your background or something. Father Presto, can you hear me? Father Preston, can you hear us? He's not muted. Your Honor, 
I can text him. Could I have just one moment? Text him, yeah. Doesn't look like he hears us. That's a text Why message he just received, I think. A priest? Oh, man. Father Presta, are you able to hear us? Okay, he cannot hear us. So what I will do while we sort that out, Your Honor, is I will have Tim's mother make a statement, and then I will, um, if we can mute Father Presta, because I don't know that he entirely. I can. Oh, can you hear us now? I can hear you now, yes. Oh, wonderful. All right, Father, raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be done? All right, you make, begin the inquiry, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Father Presta, could you just introduce uh, your full name, please, so that we can have it for the record? My name is James Presta. Where do you work, Father Presta? I'm a priest in the Archdiocese of Chicago, and I'm a pastor of St. Emily Parish in Mount Prospect, Illinois. And I believe you've prepared a statement to read to the court on behalf of Tim Ferreter. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, could you go ahead and read that statement, please? My name is Father James Presta, I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago. When I was ordained in 1986, I was assigned to St. Christopher Parish in Midlothian, Illinois. During my first few weeks in the parish, I met Tim's mother and stepfather, Maureen and John McGraw, who lived a few children down to the church. They had five children from Maureen's first marriage, and Maureen and John would then have three other children of their own during my years at St. Chris. A total of eight children in the blended Ferreter McGraw family. Tim was the third of eight children. He was in fifth grade when I arrived in the parish. He and his older brother, Patrick, were altar servers at St. Christopher's. Because I was one who trained the servers, I knew Tim. I also became friends with his family and was often invited for dinner at their home. I knew Tim also because I taught classes at St. Christopher Catholic School where all the fair of children were enrolled. And in particular, Tim was in the eighth grade when I taught a course in Spanish he was very good student. In 1993, when I was assigned to another parish, Queen of Arden in Beverly Park, Tim's family had moved to New Lenox, but I continued to remain friends with the entire family. Of the eight children, I celebrated five of their weddings, and I presided over the wedding of Tim and uh, Tracy Ferreter. I also baptized some of the children. Uh, Tim has been a very faithful Catholic layman. He was instrumental in working with Tracy to become a Roman Catholic. I've known Tim as a very kind and caring, compassionate man, a good son, husband, and father, a wonderful provider for his family. Uh, Tim came from a very loving Catholic family. I've always found Tim to be hardworking, sincere, and respectful, very friendly and outgoing, and a real people person, a man who was responsible, and a man of his word. If I asked Tim to do something for me, I knew he would do it and do it well. I have nothing but good things to say about Tim. Candidly, I was not aware of the issues Tim was having with Ronan or how he was handling it. He never confided in me about any aspect of his family life at, in, in the family home. But what I learned, Tim was facing very bad and poor choices of dealing with his son's behavior. I was certainly distraught to hear what happened in their home regarding some of these behavior problems. This doesn't seem to be the Tim Ferrier I've known over the years. Yet I know that Tim has a good heart I know he's always trying to do the right thing in, in life than the person I've known him known over the years. I know he has no criminal record. Uh, I hope that the court would at least uh, look at his past clean record and good character. As a Catholic priest and believer in God's unconditional mercy and love for his people, I believe Tim is worthy of the court's mercy. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 15 of the parable of the prodigal son, the father forgives the son for all he's done including disowning his own father. I would hope that some mercy and compassion would be shown to Tim for the good he's tried to do for his family, despite making very poor and awful parenting decisions with his son. And indeed, Tim has been a great friend and a wonderful support to me as a priest over these past 37 years. Thank you so much, Father Presta. I don't have anything additional for this witness. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Um, Ms. Copeland, any questions? No, he's just getting a statement. 
Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're gonna, you can remain in the um, Zoom room. We'll put you back in. Oh, his mic is terrible. The general population. Here. Yeah, we're muted. Thank you. Okay. All right. Call the next witness, Ms. Moore. Just a brief statement from his mother, Maureen McGraw. If it's just simply statements, I can do that from the podium. They don't need to be on the witness stand for that. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, as you know, I'm Maureen, uh, mom of Tim Ferreter. Well, I say don't condone Tim's behavior. That behavior was atypical. Tim has always been a loving and gracious son. He was never a problem and never really got into much trouble, despite the closeness of his brother, well, he and Pat used to get into little rows, but they never got into outside trouble outside the house. He was always active in sports and school activities. He was active in our church, serving as an altar server every Sunday, as Father Presta just said. Many people have said things, said nice things about Tim, and everything said is true. I remember so vividly that when Caitlin, who is my number seven, was born, he was so excited, Tim was so excited with her presence in our home that he used to take her for a walk almost every day in her stroller. Tim has always exhibited a great love for family. As he grew older, his love for his own family was apparent. He and Tracy, on their own dime, went down to work with poor kids in Honduras. Uh, they were down there for about a year, and they were teaching down there. Tim and Tracy spent that year out of the goodness of their hearts. Years later, that love for children was shown again when they departed to pick up Fiona and then again in a trip to get Ronan. To me, they were their, these actions were love, actions of love. I am imploring you, Judge Coates, to show some mercy on Tim. I'm going to be 74 next month, and I would like to spend some time with Tim before I go. Um, I loved him very much, and I respect him as a person, as a son. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. And your honor, before Mr. Ferreter allocutes, um, the state and defense did agree to two stipulations. I was unable to print them out this morning, but may I read them into the record? You may. No objection? Okay. Both the state and defense agree that the following facts are true for the purposes of this hearing, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Farrader no longer has parental rights to RF and PF. Mr. Farrader has parental rights to NF and FF. However, they are in permanent outside placements. Secondly, there was a no contact order issued in 22 DP 62 between Mr. Farrader and RF, NF, and FF. The no contact order permits contact only at the discretion of the children. All right, thank you, Ms. Morrow. Thank you. And with that, uh, if Mr. Farrader could speak, Your Honor, I can hold the mic. Oh, snap. Can you minister the oath, Madam Clerk? Do you swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, you may remain seated, Mr. Farrington. From the day I was born on the Marine Corps base in Quantico, Virginia, <coughs> until this very day, I had many challenges, but many more blessings. 
I want to give thanks to God for everything. I want to start out by recognizing that all my kids have been devastated by this entire situation, and I'm very sorry to them that they've had to go through this. Mama and I have lost all your kids. And all you have kids lost have lost your parents. I'm sorry, but his mic is horrible. There's nothing I can do about it. In my Catholic faith, we define love in the following way. Love is willing the good of the other for other. Let me say that again. Willing the good of the other for other. What do I mean by this? I'll give two examples. If at 2 a.m., my wife or I got out of bed to attend to take care of a crying baby, Fiona, Ronan, Noah, or Pierce, that act of getting out of bed to take care of the crying child is not necessarily for the benefit of Tracy or myself. It's the benefit for the crying baby. Another example, a family of six, we as a family of six, Tracy, I, Fiona, Ronan, Noah, and Pierce, we routinely visit nursing homes. We would ask to visit the elderly people who never got visitors. Bringing the kids would always burst with smiles on the faces of everyone. This act for the, it was primarily for the benefit of the elderly people in the nursing home, not for the six of us. Everything I did was out of love. I pray that as a father, you empathize with this. My life is not about me. Rather, my life is about giving up, giving it up in life, especially for my family, while doing the good of the other for other. Next, I want to speak directly to my family. Ronan, I love you. Your mama loves you. We're all very sorry for everything. Everything you have gone through and everything you continue to go through. I am empathetic to where you are placed now. I did all that I could to help you avoid that. As your father, I wish I could be by your side now and stand strong with you. I thank you, Ronan, for your honesty and courage when you spoke of mercy a few weeks back. Ronan, you were my first boy. I miss our boys' time together, Ronan. Our items together. You're such a smart boy, young man. I miss all of our cre your creative ideas you used to share with the whole family. We could always depend on you to come up with something creative and to build something that needed to be built. Ronan, well, keep up the curiosity and the desire for learning. I love you, I love you always, and please know that you'll always be my boy. Fiona and Noah, my beautiful girls, I'm deeply sorry for all that you have had to endure. For almost the last two years, my job as your father is to protect you from what has happened to you since February 1st, 2022, and I have failed at that. Please know that I love you both now and forever, and nothing will ever change that. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, but any other creature will be able to separate us from the love, from this love, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are both resilient young women, Fiona and Noah. And in the end, everything will be okay because God has a plan. Fiona, when you are ready, again, when you are ready, feel free to reach out to your extended family, including the grandparents. Everyone loves you, Fiona, and are waiting with open arms to embrace you, to love you. In the end, Fiona, all you have is your faith in your family. I miss, Fiona, I miss your sweet personality, your beautiful smile, and our intellectual discussions on literature, 
career events, religion, and other inspiring topics you came up with. I miss watching Hamilton with you. I miss hearing you sing the songs. I miss listening to the Beatles with you and Coldplay with you. I miss going on daddy-daughter dates with you. I love you always. I will love you always. You are my girl. Nola, your energy and personality always fills the room, and I love that about you. You are talented in so many ways. From your baking birthday cakes for every one of you, to your athletics. In my heart, I will always be in the stands cheering you on. Please remember this, and I'll be in the stands all the way from now until you play for another day in Arizona. Keep the joy in your heart alive, Nola. Don't lose that caring nature. I miss playing catch with you. You always threw the ball so hard it hurt my hand. I miss shooting baskets with you, playing horse one-on-one watching you dribble between your legs and around your back. I miss coaching your various teams. I miss coaching you and Fiona on basketball together. You brought many blessings to my life, and I'm grateful for that. Now, your extended family, like I said to Fiona, including grandparents, love you, and are waiting for you with open arms when you are ready. They are your only family, Noah, and we miss you dearly. I quote St. John McGraw that I say to my kids, have a great day. Ronan, Fiona, Noah, Pierce wouldn't remember, but have a great day. Know that I will always love you, Noah. You are my girl. Pierce, my baby boy, I know you're very young and don't understand what is going on, but please know that I love you, and everything I did was for you. I quote you, Pierce, when I say, I miss you always. I love you always. Please know, Pierce, that I do miss you always. And I do love you always. <laughs> I hope to be able to play hide and seek with you again, to be able to catch your, coach your t-ball team again, and to be able to go on bug adventures with you again. By the way, Noah, Pierce is also hitting from the left side of the plate, as I know you are. And he has a couple of home runs already, so watch out. Tracy, my beautiful, selfless, loving wife. We always do everything for our kids and our family first, and take care of yourself second. You are the most selfless person I know. We love all of our kids the same and initially adopted Ronan from Vietnam, so Fiona did not have to grow up without an adopted sibling, and so she had another Asian kid with her as she would be a minority where we lived. I miss all of them, and I love all of them, as I know you do. We would do anything for our kids. Once all the kids were taken, the house was silent, and all the beds were empty, we began the sad, sad journey together. I know, I know even, and now, we have even been separated. Please keep your faith strong and know that as one, please keep your faith strong and know that as none of this makes sense, we must believe that God has a plan. We know that there must be a bigger reason for all this suffering. We know we like this, so I'll say this to you. When the storm comes, do like Simon Peter and keep your eyes on Jesus. I will always love you, my beloved wife. Finally, I want to note that on the first days at the gun club jail, I've been jumped multiple times. I have had my head punched and beat until bleeding. I have been approached and threatened by multiple people that if I don't pay them on a weekly basis, I will face consequences. Also, everyone recognizes me in jail, which makes me a target every day for every new person that crosses my path. I understand the court has to make a tough decision at this point in any case, and I empathize with you and that grave responsibility that you have. I also plead of you, Judge Coates, to use your discretion 
to lean into mercy for my family and myself to make your decision. I ask that you allow me to serve my sentence outside the jail or prison, under house arrest or a monitor, under probation, so as to be able to support the ones I love and the ones that depend on me. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Any other witnesses? I don't have any additional evidence, Your Honor. Um, for argument, I will reference um, additional letters and reports that were admitted into evidence and provided. But relative to the downward departure or relative to the overall sentencing, are you able to even separate them? I can do that. Okay, all right. If, if that's all right. That's, that's fine. Okay. okay. So other than that, I don't have any additional evidence to admit at this time, and I'll save the rest for argument. Okay, all right. So, um, Ms. Coakley, yes, state ready so to I just have one uh, first witness, and then I have some um, witness impact. Okay. okay. 